thanks everyone for hanging around or if you've just come in uh, welcome to the security and privacy mini conf up now we have rob n uh, black star uh, who's going to tell us about U2F and uh, if you're wondering what the star's all about, he awarded that to himself after he successfully deflected a DDoS attack at his organisation with no downtime. So over to you, Rob. Thanks, Fraith. Yeah, that was a big week. Um, cool. Hello. Uh, my name's Rob. Uh, there's some places you can talk at me, and you should talk at me, because I'd like to know what you're up to. Um, just, there's a URL, it's already up, it's got these slides and a bunch of links and that sort of thing, so you don't need to take any notes, and there'll be some time for questions at the end. And I need to be remembered to breathe, because I'm slightly freaking out. Anyway, so two-factor auth. Here's Bono with his two factors. He's going to remind, help us remember what two-factor is about. So. Two-factor is where, at login, you present two things to establish your identity to the service. You present something you know, which is your password, and you present something you have, some physical item that uh, you've previously associated with your account that only you have access to. And the idea being that if you lose either one of these, whether they're stolen or you just lose them, your account is safe, it can't be gotten into. Um, not great for you, but good that your data stays secure. So, um, there's usually two separate uh, stages to using these. There's a registration step, um, which is at login, where you actually associate the, the token, the second factor, whatever it may be, with your account. And then at login, the service confirming that you are actually in possession of this thing. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, I don't do live demos because they break. Um, but I thought we'd have a quick look at the two sort of two-factor methods you've probably seen before, which are SMS and TOTP. I know SMS is rubbish, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. Um, so SMS registration is usually simple. This is screenshots from Fastmail. Uh, yes, yeah, so you enter your phone number, send you a code, you type the code back in, we make sure it's the same code. If it is, you've registered, you've confirmed that you are the owner of that number, and we hook it up to your account. And then later, when you're authenticating, username and password, um, if you got the password right, we look up the phone number, we send you another code, you type the code in, if the code matches, you're into your account, no problem. Um, you've, you've seen this before, you've used this everywhere. So TOTP is a time-based one-time password, uh, and it's, it's a two-factor method based on a shared secret, a shared key, and synchronized clocks. So the service will generate a key and will somehow give it to you. That's often in the form of a QR code, which you, you know, snap with your, uh, your smartphone. Um, if you don't, if your TOTP client doesn't have a smartphone, uh, sorry, of course it has a smartphone, maybe it has a smartphone, but it doesn't have a camera, uh, you get to type in this code. So you know, that's cool. But it then, the client will then combine that key with the current time, assuming a synchronized clock, we'll produce a code. This is a screenshot from free OTP because I couldn't take a screenshot of my actual TOTP app because it has a bit set that says don't let the system take screenshots, so that's cool. Um, the code's usually valid for a short amount of time, usually about 30 seconds. Um, so you type the code back in to confirm that you got it set up right, and, um, and then you're all good to go. And then again at login, username and password, you enter the, the code that currently appears on the app because it's time-based, so it's sort of constantly rolling. Um, the server then uses its copy of the key and the current timestamp to generate a code, and if those codes are the same, we log you in. That's fine. There are also TOTP hardware tokens. Um, they come with a pre-programmed key that the vendor will usually give you. You know, they'll send you an email or put it on a bit of paper, um, and then you get to type the key in to tell the server what the, sh the shared key is. But the point is, at the end of it, you, the two sides know what the key is, and it works. So that's all fine. These work. These are. The common uh, two-factor methods you'll see out there, there are others, there are proprietary things, and, but they're all the same basic ideas. They work fine, but they're a bit kind of messy. So two-factor assumes that you are the only one with access to your second factor. Um, if anyone else has it, if anyone gets hold of it, then the security around that is broken, um, because we're now back to if they know your password, 
then they get into your account and your password's the weak link again. But the problem with that is, you know, your phone number is not secure. Um, it's fairly straightforward these days for an attacker to intercept messages being sent to your number. Um, it's, not, it's not a hypothetical attack. There's a you know, download a toolkit and do some stuff. Um, TOTP is safer, but the way most people use it, it's dependent on the security of your phone, typically. Um, we can talk for a while about how secure phones are, but, you know, you can't quite be sure. So, Oh, yeah, right. Um, and all these methods have some kind of vulnerability to sort of phishing or middlemen or key logging or whatever because they're passive devices. When the code is given to the server, the server has no idea where that code came from. So it's fairly straightforward for a middleman to you know, intercept the entire login uh, uh, process and get an active account. You know, your TOTP code is valid for 30 seconds, but 30 seconds is long enough to complete authentication on your behalf and get an active session and then access to your account. So they're not terrible. They're better than nothing. Oh, yeah, the usability sucks. This is Space Team. This is a good game. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, kind of weird. See, the usability sucks. You end up, you know, you've got to type a code, hope it doesn't expire. It's, you know, So universal two-factor is a newer method of two-factor that solves a lot of these problems. So what it is, it's an open standard for a two-factor device. Um, it's defined by an industry group called the FIDO Alliance. Uh, all the specs are available to read and implement, implement the, the, uh, the sort of the, the industry organization bit is all around certification and, and these kind of things, but it's free to implement. Uh, there's hardware available from multiple manufacturers. They all work the same. There are open, so sort of open source implementations, uh, hardware and software available as well, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, there are hardware profiles for USB, NFC, and Bluetooth. Um, yeah, and multiple implementations. And it's not hard if there isn't an implementation for your language. It's not hard to implement. I did the library for Perl, and I'm not a great programmer, so, um, but it wasn't hard to put together. So the main difference between, between U2F and other things like SMS and TOTP is that uh, the device is actively involved in the authentication process. The browser communicates with it over USB. Um, and because of that, it can do a lot more than just produce a code that a user has to type in. It can get some real crypto operations into the mix um, and produce a much better experience and much better security. And some really nice features as well. Um, if you've used the, the, the standalone TATP devices, they have a single code and a single key, which means you can only securely use them on a single service. Um, with U2F, a single device can be used across multiple services without there being any tracking between those services. Um, the protocol has built-in phishing protection, has built-in cloning protection, which is interesting, and you can discover information about the device and about its security properties, how it's assembled, who manufactured it, um, and so you can use that to set policy decisions. I'll talk about that as we go. Um, there's multiple manufacturers, as I said. This is my test lab, which is mostly just be me buying all the ones I can find, confirming they work, and then putting them in a box because you kind of can't do anything else without them, with them. But um, I did bring a few. If you're really interested, you can look at some different shapes and sizes. This one's particularly interesting for this conference. This is a U2F0. Um, it's an open source design made by uh, a chap named Connor Patrick. Uh, if you go to u2f0.com, there is schematics, board layouts, uh, the firmware source, parts list, instructions how to build your own. I'm all thumbs, so I didn't do that. But he did a short run, uh, short production run last year. Um, and I think there's still some for sale on Amazon for about $9 or something. So, um, and they're fine. They work. They do exactly what you would expect them to do. Um, this one's... I only learned about just like two days ago. Uh, this is a Tomu, and it's actually a tiny ARM computer that fits inside your USB port. Um, so yeah, two buttons, two LEDs. It's a fully open design. Um, it's open hardware certified. And it's made by this guy, Tim Ansell. And the reason his mug is up there um, is because, yeah, he originally designed this board to, as a way to produce a U2F device. Um, but it's not there yet. It doesn't have the software it needs. Um, 
he is at this conference. Is he in this room? He wasn't sure if he was going to be able to make it. No, that's fine. He's at this conference. If you think you can help, um, he's got a whole bunch of development boards available. Go and talk to him and make, this, make something cool with these things, because they're really awesome. Anyway, however you get your U2F hardware, once you've got it um, in your hand, you've still got to do registration and your authentication step, just like every other two-factor device. So at registration, you will be asked to plug in the device, press the button, and then that's all you, you do. It's now registered. And then at login, again, you enter your username and password, you've, you're asked to press the button, and you're done. Um, and that's not an exaggeration. There is really nothing else to do. Um, so the user experience is about as simple as you can get. But under the hood, there's a ton of stuff happening. That's really intimidating at this size. Um, <laughs> Um, and that made it kind of hard for me to understand how to explain it. Um, you don't actually have to know how U2F works deeply in order to use it and implement it, but I figure you know, this is a security conference. People are going to want to know a little bit about the security characteristics and just what we can do when we've got an active device involved in the authentication process. So I should try, right? Okay, so. I'm going to start, I'm going to show you a bunch of diagrams. So you'll glaze over a little, but it's okay. It's not too complicated. And I'm just going to start with a simplified view of what the authentication flow looks like, and then we'll gradually add features to that until we get up to where real U2F is. So we're talking about authentication. So we're assuming that the device has already been registered. So the, it's based on public key cryptography, so the device holds a copy of the private key within it, and during registration, it has given its public key to the server. So during authentication, so this is the bit where it's saying, press the button, uh, the, the server generates a challenge, passes it to the browser, the browser hands it on to the device, the device signs it with the private key, and then it's brought back to the server, the server verifies it with the public key. If it checks out, we've confirmed that you have the device, and we can log you in. So that's nothing particularly clever. But this is still vulnerable to a phishing attack, to an active middleman, uh, because they can just pass the, the challenge and the response along, um, and the, the signature is still going to check out. So to protect against this, we actually get the, we, after we generate the challenge, we get the browser to pass the current origin around. So um, if you haven't done web stuff, the origin is basically the, the URL scheme and host name. Okay, so we pass that down to the device, and it includes the origin in the signature, and then the browser also passes that back. So we can validate the signature, and then after we've got a valid signature, we can check that the origin is what we expect it to be, because you know, we're the server. We know what domain the, the, the page is supposed to be served over. If it doesn't match, then we know there's a middleman in, in the mix, and we can take action. So that alone, we've already done better than the existing uh, uh, methods. But in our simplified model, we've only got a single private and public key pair. And that's a problem because that means every, every service you register this on has a copy of the same public key, which if you mul registered it with multiple accounts on the same service, as a service owner, I can look in my database and say, oh, this, is, this public key is used on all these accounts. They are the same person, even if they are not the same account, same billing. And if I'm somehow able to track that across other services, you know, I'm an unscrupulous service provider in some way, then I can follow your movement through multiple systems. Obviously, that's a problem. So, and this one's kind of, have to introduce a lot of concepts in one go here, but. The basic idea to get around this is at registration, we give the device the ability to mint a new key pair and give it a name and use it during authentication. So in this case, what we've got is the, the server provides part of the name, which it calls the application ID, um, and the device provides like the other half of the name, which is called the key handle. And I only mention them as separate things because they come up in the documentation a lot. So the, the server passes the app ID and the handle down with the challenge to basically say to the device, you sign, sign this challenge with the key named this. 
And again, the browser adds the origin. The device does a lookup on it in its internal store for the, uh, the key it needs. It signs it. It brings it back. Uh, the browser adds the origin. And then we do the same, public, the same lookup for the uh, corresponding public key, and we check the signature against that. And yeah, and so now we have a separate key pair for every service, for every registration, so a service provider can't actually see, sort of connect them to those together. So that's all right. Um, cloning protection, so cloning is, you know, you leave your device, someone picks it up, uses some magic method to copy the internal state of the device, um, you know, puts the other one there, walks away with that one, now they have a copy of your second factor. Now this isn't a likely mode of attack for most people, but it is for some people, and if you're trying to you know, present a practical security mechanism, you want it to work for as many people as you can in as many situations as you can. So we have a way to detect if a device has been cloned. And the way we do that, and this is getting kind of more and more squished, it's pretty much all the same. We've added a counter to the device. So every time the device performs a signing operation, it increments a counter and includes the counter value inside the signature and then it passes that back. The server stores the last counter value it saw. And if it gets a signature with a lower counter value than what, it, what it's previously seen, it knows that they're not the same device because if it was the same device, it would have advanced it further. And at that point, you can detect that you know, something's gone wrong here. You know, maybe I'll lock out that device, that device, lock out that account, whatever. It's not foolproof, obviously, if the clone device is, were, is used first, then you know, it's going to advance and the original users is not going to get there, but it's kind of better than nothing. And so that's, that was the entire authentication process. Um, and now we kind of know everything we need to include in the registration uh, when we do that. So the registration flow looks almost the same. So there's a hell of a lot more stuff in it. So the server produces a challenge and the app ID, which is it's half of the name, and it says, you know, along with the thing that says, I am registering, this is a registration operation. And it comes down, browser adds the origin, the device generates a key pair, um, and then it stores the private key it creates with the name, the app ID handle combo. Um, it signs the challenge with what's called the attestation certificate, which I'll talk about in a minute, and it passes the whole lot back. And if the signatures check out and the origin is right and all the rest of it, the server can then associate that public key and that key name with the user's account. So the attestation certificate is, it's a certificate that describes the individual device or more the individual type of device. It, the same certificate will be shared across all of a particular device model or maybe all of a production batch, not a single device because then you would be able to track where that device went because you're seeing the same unique device. But the idea behind it is to, yeah, to identify the device so that you can then make decisions based on the properties that device has. And an example is you could get a custom batch of devices created with a custom certificate and then you could restrict um, like administrative actions inside your service to users that present uh, you know, uh, 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 do only, uh, only those devices that have the correct certificate in it um, and then give them to your staff so that even if the account is compromised via a different second factor, if it's not the admin one, it can only take user actions, not admin actions. There's, it's policy stuff, so it's kind of whatever you can think of. An attestation cert is nothing special. That's, it's just an X509 certificate. Um, that's just a dump of a bit of it, and there's really nothing interesting to say. Okay, that was the boring dry bit. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I thought I needed to say something, but in terms of, you don't need to know most of that stuff. Mostly you just want to know how to implement it. Um, so there are server libraries for every language you know, you're interested in. There's not enough, there's not many yet for um, sort of newer or more esoteric languages for web services in particular. Um, I'm writing one for Rust at the moment, but like I said, they're not hard to put together. Um, they all do three basic functions. Generate a challenge, 
verify a registration response and verify an authentication response. Um, some of them do extra things to help you integrate, you know, with, with Rails or whatever, you know, the session storage or whatever, but that's sort of the minimum. They all do at least that. Um, in the browser, you're going to need JavaScript, um, and there's no way around that because you need to be able to call specific APIs to actually pass the pass data down to a USB device and get responses back and do something with it. Uh, but it doesn't have to be a lot of JavaScript, um, as in, you know, four or five lines kind of JavaScript. Browser support is reasonably good at this point, but it's not great. Um, all Chromium browsers in the last couple of years have had support for this via a thing called U2F API JS, which you drop into your application. Um, Firefox have it via an extension and I'm reliably informed that uh, it should arrive natively within the next year. Um, Microsoft have said they're looking at it, but they haven't committed to it yet. Apple have remained silent, as, as bad as you'd expect. There is an extension for Safari, which has had, it doesn't always work, but yeah. You know. On the browser, this works in Android if you use Chrome and you use the, the Google's own authenticator app and you use an NFC device. Um, that I've confirmed works, um, but nothing else really works yet. The, the way forward for mobile is probably going to be the Bluetooth profile of, of U2F devices, but uh, iOS and Android don't support the low power Bluetooth yet. So, but it is getting there. This, this is progressing. It's slowly but getting there, but it's all right. And then in terms of the actual code, these are my only code slides. Um, I just wanted to show how easy it is. So you call register with the origin or the app ID for reasons. The app ID and on the web, the app ID and the origin are the same. Uh, you pass in the challenge and it returns back either an error or some stuff that you send back to your library to do the verification. And then similarly, um, when you're signing, it's basically the same call except you include a key handle to say, use this, use the key named this when you, when you sign. Yeah, your code will be smarter than this. It'll hook into your framework properly. It'll do stuff. It'll have better error checking than mine. But I just wanted to show you that this doesn't have to be hard. This is actually really easy. So there's actually a browserless mode of operation with this. It's not just for the browser. Um, U2F devices are, well, the USB ones, are generic hid devices. So any application on your system can theoretically talk to them and use them for authentication. Um, if you were going to do that, you'd want a thing called lib2f host, which is just a C library, which does all the USB bits, talks to the, the wire protocol, all the rest of it. There aren't many people using this. The interesting one that is, is PAM U2F. So PAM is the authentication stack in a Unix system, decides, you know, do you need to present, you know, a password, a two-factor thing, uh, do we log you out, you know, within a certain amount of time or whatever. So you hook this up, you... Um, run a tool that it comes with to do the registration, and then suddenly you open your app, your laptop, and you unlock it by tapping your U2F device rather than entering a password. So, you know, you've got some options there. Um, and that's, that's particularly interesting if you've got any desktop application that wants to do any kind of authentication. So, hopefully some of you are thinking, oh, this would be cool to try out, um, but you still have to go and get a device. So, this is a Nitro key U2F device. It's a fairly cheap one. There's a little thing that you punch out, and then there's a little thing that you fold over to sort of make it thick enough for USB. There's a little dab of glue on there to hold it together. Um, I brought 50 of these to give away. Um, so you could use it to secure a Fastmail or a Dropbox or a Google account or whatever, um, or you could use it to learn how to add support for you, to it for your app. And that's pretty much it. The only condition I'm putting on that is if you do do something and you feel comfortable with it, please say something publicly, even if it's just a tweet that says, I locked myself out of my GitHub account. Um, <laughs> be, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be fine. But um, because I want to see this everywhere. This is actually a really practical um, and usable two-factor technology. Um, and yeah, I'd like to be able to use it everywhere. I'd like people to be aware, more people to be aware of it. So, um, yeah, so if you've got an idea or you want to grab one or come see me later, um, I'll be around for the rest of the week. Um, and that's just about it. Um, so just to recap, yeah, U2F's an open standard. Um, it's secure, it's easy to use. Um, there's a lot of hardware to choose from where you can build your own. 
and it's actually really easy to implement. And that's all I've got. Thanks. Um, I'm interested in, I'm not a web guy, um, I'm a server developer, and so I'm trying to think about how I really want this stuff to be transparent even for desktop logins or also just a Linux user of, um, you know, can I make it also generate my SSH keys so there's, you know, one other, I'm just wondering where, where, what, like the pan thing, logging onto your desktop, that's kind of neat, but like yeah. I, I, as I say, I work on the Active Directory, so I always think about networks of computers and things. Yeah, so uh, I'm just trying to think through the pieces of that and put that into a, put it into an answer. So you, if you want to authenticate to a server with this, you pretty much need support in the server and the client, mm. and you need you need some kind of to do it well. You need some, like transparently. You need some kind of support in your wire protocol mm. to be able to pass the challenges back and forth. And and because it's, it's actually there's actually quite a uh, quite a few moving parts in the in the protocol. Um, there is so in terms of SSH, uh, the it's not written fully yet. There are bits of patches floating around, but the the expectation is that it will require the client side will. Um, be implemented inside the SSH agent. There is a an internet dra an expired internet draft for a protocol extension for a U2F a U2F method, and then you need server support for that. There is there is a patch for um, SSHD that during login, instead of doing the handshake there, it gives you a URL. You point that at your browser, you do the U2F business there, and then it hooks back up under the hood, which is somewhere in between, because the other one that people have written is like, paste this entire chunk of JSON into this command line tool, and then, and then press the button, and then get the response back out and paste it back in, which works, but sucks. So yeah, it's, it's never, be, because, because all the pieces are actively involved in the process, there needs to be protocol and support on the client and server. Um, you may like to talk to, um, going out of limb here because I haven't talked to him, but um, Will Brown is at this conference. He's at Red Hat and he works on their directory server and he's looking at exactly this problem. Um, how, to, yeah, how to be able to do workstation logins across an entire domain. Um, he's waving from up the back, so I'm going to suggest that Great. I'm going to suggest you keep talking about this because I'm. That's not a domain I know a lot about. Yeah. But it's a good, it would sorry. be really handy if it, if it could. If, if there was an auxiliary way, it could just pop out an SSH public private key. But I guess that's each piece of hardware could do those things on its side. It'd be it, nice if there were. If it would be. Um, it's. I think. I'm going to say I think it's probably out of the scope of U2F. There is um, more advanced devices that can do that, like the YubiKey Four hmm. uh, has support for. Um, minting uh, GPG keys, which you can then use with GPG agent connected to SSH agent yeah. to have exactly the same flow for SSH. Okay. Um, it's a fairly new area still, but it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, do you imagine a world where everybody uses U2F directly for every web service, or one where you use it to go to a handful of OAuth2 providers, which then provide authentication to, because uh, you know, I have dozens or maybe even over 100 different websites that I authenticate to, and I, I can't imagine having to use it, U2F for everything. No, if, if I'm honest, my, my dreams and my expectations of reality are uh, somewhat different. I would love it if we could use it everywhere. Um, but yeah, in reality, it's going to be the, the OAuth2 case, and kind of already is. You can use U2F against Google, and then from there to any other service. So, um, but that's, that's, that's about modeling your security profile and deciding who you trust and who you don't trust. I would hope it would be everywhere. Maybe we can have a, have a shot at it. Sorry. Um, can, I, can I ask about one specific um, application that all the Australian adults should be aware of, but for the overseas people, does it? A website called MyGov, which is the authentication <laughs> to the, uh, all of your citizen level accounts on the Australian government, or that's what they want it to be. Um, how long until U2F could be used instead of SM SMSs, which is their current system? I, 
Well, obviously, you have to get one of these devices into everyone's hand. But as an NFC, you know, maybe it can be built into, I don't know, government-provided identification. I mean, that's fraught with difficult, with other problems where we're talking about authenticating to the government. I don't... Yeah, I don't really have a, an answer to that. I'd like to think this is easier than saying you require a code. So. Never, never hurts. If enough people say that, it'll start being looked at seriously. We can be cynical about it, but it will. Taiwan does this, apparently. Thank you. There you go. There's a few, there's a few uh, precedents already. Sorry. Yes. Uh, is there anything inherent about UTF, U2F that necessitates the JavaScript in the browser? Could we see, for example, a uh, U2F input element instead of file or password, et cetera? I, I was actually thinking about this last week. Um, I suppose it's possible, um, if, but I'm not, which doesn't mean at all there isn't, because I'm not aware of a lot of stuff, but I'm not aware of any push to make that happen. But it would be a really interesting thing to prototype, definitely. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, thank you. One question. How good are the keys that are generated on the devices themselves? I guess it's an RSA key or EC. It's DSA. a... It's a... Um, just reminding myself. Um, yes, there are ECDSA uh, NIST P256-1. Is that a thing? No, well, the question is, uh, it's a small device. Where does it get entropy from to generate uh, unique keys? Um, I'm going to hand wave and say magic internal random number generator. I'm not a security expert. I am an operations engineer. But I've seen enough stuff to suggest that the security, um, so the way it's put together and the way it's run, like these questions have been asked and appear to be answered satisfactorily. If that's a thing that's really important to you, um, you should definitely research that and then let me know what you find out because uh, in a way that I kind of understand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last one. Um, what do you do when you break or lose your key? Well, you're out of luck. <laughs> it's the, it's, it's, that's the same as current uh, two-factor setups. Um, the usual, the recommendation we make at Fastmail is if you are going to rely entirely on U2F, then get two keys, have one on your person and one in a safe deposit box. Um, but for that, you need to decide how your life works and what what the odds of that are and that sort of thing. And, and how does that help? Like, um, are they, isn't oh, that then the clone, the clone no, sorry. case that you're talking about? Sorry, good question. I wasn't clear. No, you, um, you register both devices. I think we're out of time. Is that right, Fraser? All right. Cool. Hey, so thank you very much, Rob, for that wonderful talk, and uh, give him a round of applause.